Hi friends and welcome to Dundonald Online. It is really great to be with you no matter where in the world you are joining us from. And if you're connecting with us just maybe for the very first time, perhaps you've joined in to find out who Jesus is, uh, we're really happy to have you with us. At any point while you're watching, you can leave a comment in the chat section on the page that you're on or you can head to dundonald.org slash connect and ask a question or leave a message and ask someone to pray with you if you'd like that. We would love for you to get in touch. In our service today, we have the chance to hear from one of our own who works for the NHS in a London hospital about how we can be praying for those on the front line of the fight of COVID-19. And we'll also be hearing, of course, from God's Word as our senior pastor, Richard Koken, teaches us from Romans 8. But as we begin, let's be reassured again of the miracle of our standing before God if we've trusted in Jesus for forgiveness and relationship. The Apostle Paul, writing to Christians in Rome in the first century AD, says this, Therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. No condemnation. No reason to try and hide from God as if we could. No reason even to fear death, which maybe is a growing fear for some of us in these days. Throughout history, through both the easier, more stable times and the more challenging times, God's people have affirmed their faith together through creeds, statements of, of what it is that we believe. You might like to join with me in saying the words of the Apostles' Creed, affirming our faith together with God's people around the world and through the centuries. Let's say these words together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. From there he shall come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Universal Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. Amen. I'll pray. Our Father, what wonderful assurance we share with your people through the ages and across the globe that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus because he has paid the penalty for sin that we deserved. He has died in our place. And so in these days, Father, when perhaps we feel we can't be sure of much, convince us more and more deeply of this, we pray, and enable us to respond to your kindness to us in Jesus today and with all our lives. Amen. James and Ellie are going to lead us as we respond to this kindness of God in our first song. You might like to join in or you can just listen and enjoy.
Hi, my name is Vicky. I attend the four o'clock congregation um, and my normal job is I'm a physiotherapist who works in the intensive care unit at a local hospital. Uh, however, since COVID began, I have been redeployed to be more like an intensive care nurse, so looking after critically ill patients in our intensive care unit. What that means um, on a day-to-day -day basis is that I've gone up to working full-time, um, 12 and a half hour shifts, and for pretty much the whole 12 and a half hours, except for maybe two, sometimes one half hour break, um, I'm wearing full PPE. Uh, what that means practically is it's very hot, and in that time we can't eat, drink, or go to the loo which has a big impact on what you can do in the day. Um, uh, it's really tough, it's exhausting. Um, it feels a little bit like we're going to war. We have shortages of stuff um, and lots of people are dying. Um, and it's really hard. Um, it feels like a little glimpse of hell. Um, I think for me as a Christian, um, it just reminds me on a daily basis that I have been saved by Christ. So as hard as it is to go into work each day, um, my life is safe in him. He is with me in it and um, that, yeah, he has already chosen the path of my life and he won't make me do anything that is beyond my ability. Um, and so it's really encouraging to be able to pray for my patients um, as well as to look after them in the best way I possibly can um, and to yeah to be able to pray to God and to tell him how hard it is and know that he's listening. Um, I've been really encouraged by listening to the song Yet Not I but Through Christ in Me on the way into work every day um, because it really reminds me that even when I feel like I can't do it which happens regularly that, that Christ is with me and that he'll give me the strength I need to do what I have to. Um, so please pray for us. Um, we really need your prayers. Please pray that we'd have the energy and the perseverance to, to get through each day. Um, pray that God would give us the strength we need. Um, please pray for good rest too. It's quite hard to rest well on your days off. Um, It'd be great to pray for enough PPE. That would be um, a lovely prayer. Um, please, please do pray for our families. Um, it's really hard coming home and not still living out what you've lived in the day. So pray for perseverance for them. Um, and please pray that as Christians in this environment that we would imitate Christ. Um, people show all sorts of areas of personality in high stress levels. So pray that we'd show love and compassion to our work colleagues. I think it's, um, yeah, pray for that. Um, and yeah, pray that people would see that as well. Um, I had a great opportunity to, one of my colleagues asked me the other day why I was a Christian. Um, that was really encouraging. We don't have much time to talk at work because we're so busy, but um, it's amazing to be able to have that conversation so please pray that we'd have opportunities to live out our faith and pray that we have opportunities to tell others as well uh, and yeah um thank you for praying um please do keep remembering us in our in, our, in your prayers um we really appreciate it please close your eyes and join us in prayer Heavenly Father, we thank you for the unconditional love and mercy that you give us, for the sacrifice Jesus Christ made so that we can have a blessed and eternal relationship with you. It is in these unprecedented times that we look and pray to you. In the midst of these challenging times where people are suffering with physical or mental issues, let us not forget that you are in control following your perfectly formulated plan. We are thankful for the energy and perseverance that Vicky and all NHS workers have each day. Please be with them as they continue. We pray for good rest, enough personal protective equipment, and importantly to be Christ-like in looking after patients and with particular attention when interacting with colleagues, which can lead to opportunities to tell others of the hope that we have. We pray also for the International Cafe, who have moved to a new venue at Emmanuel Church, 
and amazing to hear that the number of guests has increased in the last quarter. In particular, a group of Portuguese guests may God enter their lives and speak to them. We are also grateful that a few people from Emmanuel Church have joined the CAFE team. During the lockdown, we pray that CAFE leaders work out how best to deliver the International CAFE using video conferencing and hope that this doesn't hamper friendships and gospel conversations happening outside of the Tuesday evening meetings. We pray to you, O Lord, for Muslims as well as Christians living in Muslim countries during this Islamic month of Ramadan, which started last Thursday. During this time of prayer and fasting, we pray that many Muslims would encounter and consider the Lord Jesus and accept him as their one true God and Saviour. And for Christians, would they know the Lord's protection and sustenance during what can be an isolating and dangerous time with opportunities and great boldness during this month, in spite of the added challenges of the coronavirus, and that he would use their witness to show his glory and hold out his grace. Dear Lord, though we are socially isolating ourselves, let us commit some family time to you to mindfully speak to our neighbours, family and friends. And lastly, despite not being together, we thank you for our church family. Help us to be supportive to each other. In your name, Lord Jesus Christ and Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. Heavenly Father, thank you that you created this world for us to live in and that you will always respond to our prayers. Sorry that you, we sometimes run away from you like sheep running away from their shepherd. Please help us to know that this pandemic is going to be okay. Amen. Our reading today comes from Romans chapter 8 and we're reading verses 18 to 25. Romans 8, starting at verse 18. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning, as in the pains of childbirth, right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved, but hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. This COVID-19 pandemic and the impact of lockdown underline the obvious fact that this world is suffering. Daily we're hearing tragic stories of heroic hospital workers who've died of coronavirus, and we are trying to prepare for the biggest financial crisis since the Great Depression. Of course, there's nothing new about suffering. We've known about that long before we knew what PPE is. Of course, it's obvious that lots of suffering in the world is directly caused by human wickedness. For example, war in Syria, or stabbings in Streatham, poverty in Ethiopia, child pornography online, tyranny in North Korea, or criminal gangs profiting from bogus vaccines. But then other afflictions seem to be rather random natural disasters. Famines, cancers, tsunamis, accidents and viruses. Tragedies that we often call acts of God. They bring devastation and misery into people's lives and nobody seems to cause them. Unbelievers and believers alike ask, if God is there, then how can God allow so much suffering? Some, of course, accuse God of cruelty in all this. Within Stephen Fry's blasphemous rant on Irish television, he did pose the reasonable question, bone cancer in children? What's that about? 
For many of us, of course, it isn't just the concept of a global pandemic that challenges our faith in God, but rather it's the personal pain of watching someone that we love struggling in a wheelchair or lying in a coffin. Indeed, contrary to the lies of prosperity preachers on the God Channel, Christians are not immune from such pains. Christians are getting sick and dying from coronavirus. Only last week, a dear Christian friend had a heart attack and died at just 58. We all want to know, why does God allow such suffering? And doesn't being a Christian make any difference? How do we know that the eternity in heaven promised in the gospel isn't just pie in the sky when you die? Of course, in the midst of personal pain and loss, we, we don't need pious platitudes or theological debates. We need someone to be there for us, to cry with us, to carry us when we're too weak to stand. But at more distance from personal suffering, as we prepare for it or perhaps reflect upon it, the Bible has much to teach us and much to comfort us with. Not least because in the extreme love of God, who gave himself to us in Jesus to suffer homelessness and prejudice, betrayal, torture and crucifixion, to save us from eternal suffering for a new world without any suffering. We're praying to a God who knows what we feel. The Christian hope of heaven, you know, is unique. When the terrible 2004 Boxing Day tsunami killed nearly 250,000 people and displaced new, nearly 2 million people, it struck me that the religions of the worst affected areas didn't seem to offer much hope. Hinduism, for example, which is the dominant faith of India, regards suffering as what we deserve for evil done in a previous incarnation, the balancing of karma forces, which we must just learn to accept. Islam, which is the dominant religion of Indonesia, regards suffering as determined by the will of Allah, his finger of judgment upon wickedness, to which we must submit without protest. Buddhism, the dominant religion of Sri Lanka, regards suffering as a kind of illusion created by our frustrated longings for happiness from which we must learn to escape. Those world religions seem to me to be entirely devoid of any hope. Faced with such uninspiring options, many like Richard Dawkins retreat into atheistic despair and conclude that suffering is just the unfortunate collision of natural forces. We kind of need to get over it. He famously wrote, in a universe of blind physical forces and genetic replication, some people are going to get hurt and other people are going to get lucky and we won't find any rhyme or reason in it. Of course, disbelieving in God doesn't make the world any less painful. It just removes all hope for the future. Many atheists assume that suffering must undermine Christian confidence because they often think we believe in a God who's trying very hard but failing spectacularly to be like Father Christmas, a sort of gentle, kind, kindly person sitting in the sky trying to make things better but failing. And so a natural disaster or a virus proves that he probably doesn't exist. Or that he certainly isn't loving but cruel because he doesn't stop the suffering. Or he's not powerful but just a therapeutic psychological crutch because he can't stop the suffering. They generally neglect the alternative that is proclaimed in the Bible and explained in this passage in Romans 8. That more good will come from our loving and powerful Father in heaven allowing this terrible suffering to continue because of his long-term salvation plan that will bring greater blessing in the end to more people. The Bible is full of deep reflection upon human suffering and on the promise of the gospel of heaven for his people. You can read books like Job or Psalms 
or Habakkuk in the Old Testament or the letter of 1 Peter in the New Testament. But I think nowhere is more helpful for us than Romans chapter 8, which we're going to be studying over the next three weeks. Let me give you a bit of a background here. God's gospel hasn't yet stopped all the suffering, is the message of chapters 1 to 8. In chapters 1 to 5, Paul has explained the gospel of God regarding the Son of God, which is the power of God for the salvation of anyone who believes it, because it reveals how people under the wrath of God, that's all of us because of our rebellion against him, can be qualified for heaven through faith in God, and so be at peace with God. In chapters 6 to 8, he's then explored the impact of this gospel upon our daily experience. We've been reconciled to God as his children, and we are free from the controlling tyrannies of sin, law, and death for a life that we now live in the power of his Holy Spirit. But our, salva our salvation experience is not yet complete it's not yet finished. We haven't yet experienced resurrection into God's new creation. He's just explained in verse 17 that we're still sharing in Christ's sufferings while we wait to share in Christ's glory. But now at the beginning of our passage in verse 18, Paul makes a bold statement, an amazing statement about suffering. And then in the rest of our passage, he offers three proofs, reassurances, that his statement is true. So here is the bold statement. You find it in verse 17 to 18. He says, basically, as co-heirs with Christ, our sufferings will be greatly outweighed by our glory to come. Look with me at verse 18. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. Paul has been explaining that when we trust in God's son, Jesus, we share in Jesus' privileges as God's children, adopted children looking forward to sharing his glorious inheritance in heaven. But like Jesus, we must travel the desert road of hardship before we arrive at the promised land of glory. We must endure what Paul calls here our present sufferings. This includes the sickness and suffering of this age, including perhaps COVID-19, which is also increased for Christians by the hostility of scornful opposition and even persecution for our faith. As we'll see next week, he will go on to explain that this isn't because God couldn't find an easier way to bring us home, but because God wants us to become more like his son, Jesus, through this process in our lives. When we wonder how secure our future is and whether it will be worthwhile in the end, Paul offers this outrageous statement. Did you, did you see it? I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. It's going to be way, way better and so much worth all the suffering when we get to heaven. Now, remember, this is the Apostle Paul who describes in his letter to the Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 11, his crushing workload, frequent imprisonments, regular floggings, multiple beatings, stoning, shipwrecks, deprivation, dangers and worries. And yet here he says that the glory, that is the outward splendor of God's inner holiness, which we, with which we shall be infused in heaven through Christ, a bit like electric light bulbs plug, plugged into the mains, the glory we will experience then will make all our sufferings now seem trifling. In fact, in 2 Corinthians 11, he says, it'll make them seem light and momentary. Light and momentary. The sufferings of his many years of ministry were appalling, and he says, they seem light and momentary compared with the glory of heaven. If you ponder that for a moment, how marvelous must it be to share in the glory of Jesus in heaven to make such suffering seem light and momentary 
just a moment, a trivial, superficial thing compared with the depth and longevity of the glory in heaven. Now, some Christians are prone to exaggerate the blessings of being a Christian now, which does tend to distort our expectations, which can lead to terrible disappointment in Christians, but also damages the credibility of our faith to unbelievers who can see that we suffer like others do. For example, one church leader wrote in his very unimpressive booklet on heaven and hell these words. I sometimes say to people that I'm not really interested in going to heaven because I'm already in heaven. Heaven is where Jesus is, and if Jesus comes to live in me, things can't get much better than that, he says. I'm afraid he uh, may suffer uh, before he discovers that's not true. He seems to have forgotten that Jesus hasn't yet returned from heaven. We have his spirit in us, but Jesus is still at the right hand of the Father in heaven and will one day return. I'm so glad that he's in for a wonderful surprise when he finally gets to the new creation and discovers how wonderful it truly is. But it does raise the question, what assurance do we have? What proof is there that we will get there? And how do we know that it will be wonderful when we get there? That it's worth God prolonging this world of sickness and suffering to give more people the chance to be saved? What assurances do we have? Paul gives three assurances that his statement that it will be all worthwhile in the end is true. He points to the creation longing for glory, He points to other Christians longing for glory, and he points to the Holy Spirit in us longing for glory. Look at each in turn, the longest is the first. God's creation groans for glory, for liberation into our glorious freedom. This is verses 19 to 20. Look with me at verse 19. For, it should be there, it's in the original language, for the creation waits in eager expectation for the sons of God to be revealed. You see, God has connected the condition of his created universe to the condition of humanity. And so Paul sort of personalizes the natural order, describes it as waiting. That word waiting is mentioned constantly throughout the passage because that's what our Christian life feels like, waiting for the glory to come. He says the creation waits in eager expectation. It's the kind of word that describes someone who's craning their neck in a crowd to catch a glimpse of a superstar who will soon be arriving. Why so eager? Verse 20. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it. That is, God has put this world under lockdown But that's because he has a well-prepared and much-published exit strategy. Verse 21. In hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the glorious freedom of the children of God. In other words, ever since humanity first rebelled against God, this amazing, amazing universe which God created as the theater in which to display his own glory and to provide lovingly for all our needs, has been subjected by God to frustration in judgment upon our rebellion. This frustration is a a bondage to decay, says Paul, which describes what scientists now call, call entropy. That is the continuous tendency of all matter to disintegrate and to lose heat, which means that our universe is aging and decaying and growing tumors and viruses, and dying. But there is a thrilling purpose behind this lockdown, says verse 22. We know the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. God had a purpose in subjecting this creation to its frustration. That is to say, the process of childbirth. He's talking, of course, symbolically. And it's not that the rocks are actually making any groaning noises, but the the suffering and the pain of our natural world, whether in cancer in our cells or coronavirus in our blood or Dutch elm disease in our forests or destructive CFCs in our ozone layer, they're not like the agonizing cries of someone dying, but of a woman 
crying out in childbirth. Um, speaking for myself, obviously without experience, but as an admirer, having watched my heroic wife give birth to five wonderful children, on the last occasion she famously declared to the midwife in attendance, I can tell you this is a lot worse than it looks. But then our lovely daughter was born, who brings us so much joy. All that dreadful pain was worthwhile in the end. Likewise, when God finally renews this creation in the resurrection power of Jesus and brings in the billions of people from this world of all nations into the new creation, the new creation will be so beautiful, so full of joy and happiness in his people that the sufferings of this age will seem worthwhile. Do you see? The sufferings of this world will be outweighed by the scale of the glory and joy in God's people in the world to come. That's why God continues to delay the creation, the sufferings of the creation. In other words, he lets the world in its pain carry on because he's saving more and more and more people from all nations into the glory of the new creation. Of course, even this world is not all corrupted. Just think if the stunning beauty of snow-capped Alps the happiness of a Mediterranean beach are all part of a groaning creation. How glorious will the renewed and perfected creation be when God finally wipes away our tears and there'll be no more hospitals or hearses. We'll be refreshed with the spiritual abundance of the water of life, healed by the leaves of the tree of life to see and to serve our Saviour. In fact, you might say COVID-19 is a song the lament of a groaning creation, longing to be liberated from decay into the glorious freedom that we shall enjoy, not in the despair of death, but in a hope in the hope of a woman in childbirth. Well, there's the first reassurance. The groaning of this creation for the world that is to come is the first proof, says Paul, that we're on our way to a world worth waiting for. The creation is clearly twisted and longing to be renewed. That is because it's on its way. Now Paul turns to a second proof. Secondly, he says, God's people groan as we wait for our final adoption. This is verse 23. Not only so, so not only is the creation groaning, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the spirit within us, Grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. Unlike the inarticulate groans of the impersonal natural world, believers in Christ groan in our inner being, in our prayers to God, as we long for God to send Jesus back and to begin the resurrection. This is partly because we enjoy the presence of God's Holy Spirit in our lives as the first fruits of the bumper harvest to come. The presence of God's Spirit in, a, in God's people is the pledge and foretaste and guarantee of the feast to come. We long for the full experience of heaven. And therefore it's frustrated because we know how good it is to have the Spirit within us helping to experience and know Jesus, know the Father through Jesus for ourselves. It's wonderful to be a Christian, but it makes us long for the full experience of heaven. I suppose it's a bit like the frustration of waiting in a long wedding line. We are in the line to meet the happy couple and enjoy the wedding banquet. The fact that we're there reassures us that we will get to the end of the line eventually. But being served with one delicious canapé and one glass of bubbly, it makes us yearn, but it also helps us to wait patiently. You see, it increases our expectation. We can't wait to get to the end of the line. But it also helps us to wait patiently because we know it's going to be great when we get there. And that's what the Holy Spirit does in our hearts as he's introduced us to the Father through Jesus. We have begun to taste how good it will be to be in the presence of God in the new creation. Paul says, verse 24, for in this hope we were saved. But hope that is seen is no hope at all. 
Who hopes for what he already has? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. In other words, he says, this is future. It's something we hope for. It's something certain. It's not an uncertain thing. It's completely secure, but we don't yet have it yet. Now, those of us who haven't yet turned to Jesus don't have his spirit within us. So we experience neither the excitement of hope nor the frustration of waiting. And we will have both when we become a Christian because we're looking forward to the feast of heaven. Paul has already described Christians as adopted into God's family as his children. Yet he says here, we must wait for the adoption, for the redemption of our bodies. That is in resurrection, when we're all resurrected into the new world. That is not because it's uncertain, but because our joy will only be complete when we finally arrive in the renewed creation. I suppose it's a bit like orphaned children living in a miserable orphanage when a loving family has visited and chosen to adopt us into their fabulous family home. The legal papers have all been signed. Our adoption is absolutely certain. And although the family, but although the family keep ringing us every day to tell us how much they're looking forward to having us in the new home, they explain to us that they are delaying a little in order to adopt some other children as well. And so we are waiting to be collected from the misery of the orphanage into the happiness of a new home. And so there's a bittersweet mixture of joy and frustration. Paul is saying that God has adopted us into his wonderful new family with a sure hope of a wonderful life in his new home, a secure and glorious future found in no one else. But at the moment, while God's spirit keeps calling us every day through the scriptures to reassure us how much God is looking forward to seeing us in his home, we are still living in the orphanage. But life is not like it once was. We have the reassurances of God in his word. And all around us, we now have a growing number of kids who share in the excitement. Others who are becoming Christians. And their excitement reassures us that it's true and that it'll be worthwhile when we get there. It's worth saying, I suppose, that online church is okay. But one of the biggest costs of not meeting together physically is not feeling the reassurance of Christian brothers and singers uh, and sisters singing of the future we share as we normally do, singing our hearts out as we encourage one another that we're on our way to God's home. We're not able to see the confidence in one another's faces, except perhaps on Zoom. But we can still understand that the normal Christian life is about patiently waiting in the sure and certain hope of a new world to come. If we get that the Christian life is waiting patiently, we will, delivered from, will be delivered from equal and opposite errors. You see, since the best is yet to come, we don't have to exaggerate how good it is now or claim that we are perfect or pain-free now. We're not. We will know suffering. We will know failure. But the best is yet to come. But also the certainty of our hopes for the future does change everything about life now. So although we're not yet in heaven, heaven changes how we feel now. For just as, for example, we can bear the grind, the daily grind of a boring job, if we have a wonderful holiday booked to look forward to, if you can remember what that's like, obviously in lockdown, it feels a long time away. In the same way, Christians, though we groan in our suffering, we groan not only because it's hurting, but because we know we've got so much look, to look forward to. We know how great it will be to see Jesus and to be in his presence. So do you see there are two reassurances there that it will be worthwhile in the end? The first reassurance, the groaning of God's creation points to the glorious future to come. Second, the groaning in other Christians points us to the glorious future to come. Third and lastly, God's spirit within us is groaning in prayer for us. This is verse 26. In the same way, the spirit helps us in our weakness. You see, without the Holy Spirit of God in us, we wouldn't have the first clue about God's plans or how to pray about them. Indeed, says Paul, 
We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groans that words cannot express. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints in accordance with God's will, that is, intercedes for God's people. While Christ intercedes for us in heaven, representing our interests to the Father in heaven, the Spirit intercedes for us in our own hearts, speaking to God to ensure our future glory. So in our weakness of suffering and confusion, we often don't understand what to pray. We don't know what to say. But don't worry about that. For the Spirit of God within us is in constant close communion with God the Father and God the Son for us. I think Paul is speaking here not so much of our clumsy prayers and confused longings, but speaking of the Spirit's union with the Father and the Son. We can feel reassured to know that God's Spirit is always representing our interests to the Father and the Son from within us. That's a real reassurance to know that he is representing our needs in prayer. It's a bit like the difference, I suppose, between dealing with a dodgy holiday company making very dubious promises about nearing, being near the boot beach on the end of the phone and looking forward to staying in a place that's owned by somebody in the family. You know, if you can remember, if you're trying to book a holiday and you ring the company and they're making all these bold claims that sound pretty uncertain and exaggerated, and you feel very uncertain about whether there's any reality to the promises. Compare that with, though, if a member of the family um, has a holiday cottage. My wife, Sean's family, have a pretty little cottage in West Wales, in Newquay. And when we've booked to go there, we've never felt anxious about arriving and find that it it's already booked or that we've been moved miles away from the beach or that the company has gone bust because Sean has arranged it with the family. It's all arranged within the family. Likewise, Christians don't need to worry that we might either never arrive in heaven or when we get there find that it's disappointing because the Holy Spirit within us is constantly in touch with the Father and the Son to ensure that the new creation is wonderful and expecting us. I suppose you might say, our luxury apartments in heaven are waiting for us. The beds are made and sprinkled with rose petals. The bubbly is on ice. The bath is run. The views are spectacular. And our seats at the Saviour's wedding banquet are all secured and all at our host's expense. And the Spirit is in constant communion with the Father to make sure it's well prepared. So as we conclude, what is all this reassurance for? Well, basically, in the book of Romans, it's this, to keep proclaiming this hope in the midst of even of this pandemic. These three kinds of groaning reassure us that what we are waiting for in hope is sure and certain and worth waiting for. The groaning of God's creation shows us that the best is yet to come in the new world. The groaning of God's people reassures us that we certainly will share in the glory of Christ. And the groaning of God's spirit within us reassures us everything is arranged and will be ready for our arrival. But the reason Paul is writing about this to reassure the Romans of their future is not only to comfort them in their sufferings, but also to urge them to keep on supporting mission to the world, to keep supporting the proclamation of God's gospel of hope for the future to a suffering and dying world. He's actually wanting to recruit their support for his mission to Spain, but also to encourage them to keep proclaiming the good news of Jesus to the world around. Likewise for us, this passage is not only a comfort to us as we face sickness and suffering and perhaps real economic hardship in the weeks and months ahead. It's also an encouragement to do everything we can to keep supporting gospel outreach, both locally friends and family and colleagues and around the world in the midst of this dreadful pandemic. Because we have solid reasons for the hope of a glorious future that people without Christ simply do not have. It was terrific that a great crowd gathered on Zoom on Thursday 
uh, at 8 p.m. for Tom's lockdown evangelism training. It'd be great to have even more uh, joining that training this coming Thursday evening. But let's do more than just lots of training. Let's take every opportunity that God gives us, gives us to tell people that our hope of a resurrected creation is based upon the resurrection of our Savior. It's a sure and certain hope. And we know it's true from the obvious groaning of creation, for the groaning of Christians all around the world, and for the groaning of the Spirit within us. And next week, Paul will tell us what God's purpose is in allowing us to suffer. And you won't want to miss that. But let's now bow our heads in prayer. I'll lead us in a prayer to thank God for the reassurances of this passage. Let's pray together. Let's bow our heads. Almighty God, we're very conscious at the moment we live in a world full of pain and suffering, and we indeed are not immune from it. We do pray, Lord God, that you'd help us to be there for those around us, to be ready to support where we can, to uh, be what people need wherever we can. But we also pray, Lord, you give us many opportunities to speak about this wonderful hope that we have, this sure and certain confidence that you have prepared a new creation, a new world to which we can be resurrected one day. We thank you that the groaning of creation reassures us that there is a wonderful new world to come. We thank you that the groaning of Christians all around us uh, encourages us to remember that this hope is sure and certain that uh, we really will be glorified in Christ. We thank you that the groaning of the spirit within us is constantly representing our needs and our hopes to the Father and the Son. Thank you that we can be confident that this future is real and on its way. And therefore we can wait patiently, even in the midst of suffering. And please help us to proclaim this wonderful news to all those around us, that they might come to Jesus and know this hope for themselves. We ask this in the name of our risen Saviour, Jesus. Amen.
Thanks, Ellie and James. Well, what good news. I hope, a certain hope, that we wait for, absolutely confident, in the redemption to come. Let me pray as we close. Father, it might be hard for us to grasp that present sufferings and hardships could be overshadowed and outshone by what you have in store for us. And yet we know that this is what you have planned, guaranteed by your promise, and that we have already now the first fruits of the Spirit assuring us of the redemption to come. Help us trust in you and to wait eagerly, looking to our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thanks so much for being with us today. Uh, do get in touch if you've got questions or you'd like to find out more. And don't forget to check the website for more information, other resources that might be encouraging to you. You can ask someone to pray with you or for you if you'd like, dundonald.org slash connect. Thanks for being with us. Have a great week.